the DOS DVRs. We're looking at the 4 channel, the 8 channel and 16, or it would be if I hadn't sold out of all the 8s and 16s. Um, they've been going incredibly popular for us over the last few months because of their reliability, because they're solid and relatively easy to set up as well. So hopefully they'll give you a bit of an idea of how easy they are this morning and show you through some of the basic and more advanced settings for it. And I'll try to take you through the network settings as well. It's going to be a little bit hard here because I'm going to network set, uh, network cable and connection set up for it, but I'll show you what it should look like and you've got a handout in front of you that I'll go through in a bit of detail. Um, those handouts are on the Radio Parts and DOS website, so if you lose it, goes in the back of the van, gets water damaged or anything else like that, it's there and you can access it through your iPhones and iPads if you wish to as well. Um, it's written by one of our advertising guys upstairs, he's done a great job of it. There's just one point I want to make in addition to everything else that's on there already. But, uh, password is one two three four five six. I don't want to know that. <laughs> Mind you, the TSA guys and the guys at the airport probably want to know that too. Like know each password. Um, the first thing first. Nobody really wants a DVR. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, "I must have CCTV because I really want to see what's going on." For them. A DVR is unfortunately something that's necessary in a lot of businesses. It's something that's it you know, keeps people from stealing from you, it puts off thieves, it catches them if they do actually end up catching, uh, if you do end up stealing something. And unfortunately it's also necessary in domestic situations where for a variety of reasons you need to make sure you know what's going on inside your house and around your property and that sort of thing. We've had a few inquiries fairly recently actually from guys out in the countryside, farmers out in the middle of nowhere with big fuel tank that they use all the time and people are just driving in through the gates, filling up themselves with full of fu free fuel and then wandering off down the road. And that's happening more and more often as the prices on fuel go up and the farmers are struggling more. You know, it's a really tough situation for them. So they look at DVRs, they look at CCTV cameras that have got cam um, memory built <laughs> into them so that they can watch exactly what's going on. So one of these things is unfortunately a bit of a preventative measure as well as a measure of last resort. There's some statistics which I, I couldn't find the exact report, it's from about six months ago, was saying that of all the um, thefts that have taken place at properties with and without CCTV systems, 90% of the crimes that weren't committed were because people were put off by the look of cameras. You know, it was purely a deterrent. They saw these things up there and they said, no, we're, we're going to go for somewhere easier. Um, the only ones that kept on going were ones where there was something incredibly valuable and they thought they could get past it and go in and work the system. So most of what you're going to be doing with these is going to be a deterrent for the business owners. You might, for business owners and for private property, sometimes you'll get them, you know, you'll catch your staff doing things that they shouldn't be doing or um, around the house, maybe the dog's making a lot of noise and you can't work out why until you see that fox running through on the camera in the backyard as well. So a good little device for all of that. Essentially a DVR is very simple. Hard drive, inputs for cameras, you know, up to 16 in the case of these ones, and a cable to run out to a monitor so that you can show what's going on. Um, inside the DVR, it's not much more complicated than that as well. I'm just going to switch this over to the DVR itself. The setup for it is quite simple, and I'm going to take you through the steps and the bits and pieces for it now. I'm going to breeze through some of the early stuff because most of it you will know already. Uh, from setting themselves up yourself and working with them every day, like the guys in the showroom here. Um, there's one final point I wanted to make too. A DVR is a complete system. Most people don't have parts of DVRs lying around or CCTV systems existing. Um, most times you'll get called in to say, I need a brand new CCTV system. I need cameras, I need cables, I need power supplies, I need the connections, I need the DVR, I need the hard drive. Everything else set up for you. So it's a great opportunity to sell somebody a complete package installation and instruction and demonstration and everything else. But there's one thing that I haven't mentioned that's a really, really, really big one that every single DVR should have and it comes down to a quite simple thing. If I was a clever thief and I wanted to break into a building and I knew there were CCTV cameras around, the very first thing I would do would be to knock out the power. If the DVR doesn't have power, cameras don't have power. If they, well, if the DVR and the cameras don't have power, there's no vision, there's no recording, and I can wander through the place without 
too much of a worry. If there's an alarm system there on battery, that might be more of an issue. But if this thing doesn't see it, I can trigger the alarm, be in and out fast enough that I can take whatever I want and go. So whenever you're selling a DVR system, I would always specify in a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply of some kind. Um, customers don't think they need it until you tell them exactly that situation, and then, yeah, they'll have one. They're not that expensive as well. You know, for 150 to 200 bucks on top of everything else, yeah, it's a very, very simple thing that will give you peace of mind and continue the DVR when power goes down. Depends on the size of the battery inside the UPS. Um, depends what you want to do with it. But the basic one probably lasts you a couple of hours. Um, more expensive ones, you can get solutions that will last you for weeks if you absolutely have to. Um, but a common one, probably at the power ratings of these things, maybe four to five hours or so, conservatively. So not too expensive for a bit of backup, but if you want to work that out for your customer, let us know. We've got, we can do the calculations and we can show you how to do it. So. Just most people go away for like a week at a time, so yeah. there's no use turning the power off. Yeah. Most criminals know if you're away for a week. Yeah. Right, I'll turn it off today and I'll come back tonight. Yeah, exactly. So that too. So the longer, longer UPS you can, the better. There's also settings in this thing. You can output an alarm to say the power's gone out too. And you can send an email message. You can do all sorts of other stuff with it. So that if you're on your way up to the Gold Coast and you get an email that says you know, power has gone off at home, hopefully there's somebody nearby that you trust enough who's going to go by and check the property out or you can call your security company or the local cops or whatever else it is to come and look after it for you too. But that much time calling the cops, they don't care. <laughs> well, they don't care got, when your alarm goes off. If you've got friends that are in the cops, maybe they might really help you out. But uh, yeah. It's called my neighbour. That works. But they call the police and do that we can do it to some of these Yeah, I know. I've seen it and heard it from everything else as well. And we'll have a discussion, we'll do the training session for the uh, NES security alarms again in the new year too. So. And sort all that out. Alright, so let's get into the DVR itself. Um, the four channels that we've got here is a four channel display. It's pretty simple. There's a option to show each of the channels individually, if you wish to. Well, that's a big screen and you can see exactly what's going on there. It's pretty easy. And there's even a tour mode, which is that scrolling mode that you've seen before, where it goes from channel 1 to channel 2 to channel 3 to channel 4, then back to 1 and on it goes. Um, if you, all of these options that I'm doing here, I'm right clicking to do it. Whenever you want to get in and out of the menus here, right click is generally your friend. It exits you out of whatever screen you've got into and it brings up the next one. So in this case, if I had a pen tilt and zoom on this one, I could control that from here. If I wanted to change the color settings to work for the uh, white and the excessive lighting that's in here, I could do that through it as well. Searching for times and dates and other problems like that that have come up. And I'm just going to change this for a moment. It's just dumping that off the top of the screen, so I'll change it down a bit. Reset this thing. Um, I'll show you through in a minute. It's just, uh, I was playing around with it to make it look better earlier, and it, when it did that, it uh, blew all the settings off the top of the screen. So, set it back to the way it was, and then let's see how we go. Sit down. I should get back on in a minute. Um, the idea we're going to go through the menus. I'll blow through the um, the individual. Um, like picking up the recordings and things like that quite quickly because it is quite a simple matter of choosing the time and date and the camera that you want to look for and find the details that are there. Some of the basic settings like the display ones are stuff that you're well and truly familiar with because you've all owned PCs and computers at some point so you know how to, to get in there and, and work with it. And password for all of ours by default is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's probably one of the first things you'll want to uh, adjust once you're into these things and, change and want to um, secure it for good. But keep in mind that if the password is lost, the major, the master password for it, it has to come back to us here for that unit to be reset. Um, whole, that whole box has to come back to us here for it. Um, security reasons, there's hardware in there that needs to be swapped in and out and other things like that to reset it properly. So. 
if this is out in the middle of nowhere, make sure somebody knows the password very, very well. That's the point, Ben, that only two people within Radio Parks have that password, because obviously being accessible over the web, using that password, you could get access to anyone's DVR, so we don't even allow salespeople to have access to that password. Yeah. So we get called out in the middle of nowhere to help with it. There's not much we can do except bring it back to Melbourne as well. So just be aware if that happens, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a drama. All right, so the main menu is uh, main menu is here. The first option is for playback and for searching for the recordings. And you can actually see that it is on the screen this time. So I can search from here. I can choose a channel. I can choose all channels and do a search and find all the recordings that have been done by time. So if I look at this one here, and I go down to the bottom and press play, this is our technician when he put the hard drive in there for me yesterday. He just set the camera up and going last night. And so this is the four, cam the four camera recording for what it was seeing like yesterday. If I go down, scroll down to the bottom of the screen, the bar comes up that shows me times and I can skip forwards and backwards through the recording to see where anything might have changed and what's happened overnight. Obviously not much in this case. But right click out of that and then you can choose through again and do the searching and find, let's say, this one. There's probably not much on this as well. Yep, again this morning when the power came back on again. So that's quite simple to go through and find those recordings. And these ones have been triggered in this case, by, uh, by power on and power off. They haven't been triggered by motion detection or anything else like that. So if there were motion detection, you'd see that movement, and you can see how long it's going to last for in the configuration, which we're going to move to now. So the system config is the first one. Sorry, this is just a bit short for me to hang over it all day. System time is obviously incorrect, because I haven't said it. This just comes straight out of the box yesterday. Set that to the correct time. Set the format that you want. There's a daylight savings time option as well, which should be set for a certain standard. Hit the set button and that will control it in there. So if I want to change this to wherever we are now, 9.25 a.m. 9.24.57, yeah, that's good enough. Save that and suddenly you can see up the top right hand corner it's changed over to the right one. Date separated, time formats and all the rest of this stuff is pretty basic. The hard drive full. You can stop the recording at the end of the hard drive, if you wished. Um, it's sort of a holdover from a lot of the VHS tapes that they used to stop at the end of the VHS tape. It made a noise, you pulled the tape out, put a new one in, and then you recycled those tapes every week or every day or however long it took. It's unlikely you're going to want to do anything other than overwrite. And when it does that, it just jumps back to the start of the disc and starts from the start recording through again. Pack duration is essentially recording time. So say my uh, I'm recording 24 hours a day. It splits it up into 60 minute increments from here. I can split it up to 15, 15 minute or five minute or up to I think 90 minutes is the maximum on this one. Um, essentially, that's for when you want to play back the recordings. If you set it to five minutes, you'll get a stack of recordings. but you'll only have to skip backwards and forwards between the five minutes that you know something happened. So when does it start recording? Can you set it to start from like 6 a.m.? Yeah, it goes six to 7 to 8 tomorrow? Yep, absolutely. <coughs> um, that's in the next menu I think we'll get to, so I'll show you that in a second. Oh, that's right. Um, DBR number, you can actually put multiple ones of these on a network and identify them separately. Call this one DBR8, another one could be DBR9, another one 10, or whatever else you want to do. Video standard will be PAL in Australia, and auto logout means if I've got this thing sitting here for 10 minutes without touching it or without doing anything, I have to enter that password again to get into it. Uh, just a security feature. You can extend that up to, I think, 60 minutes, or down as low as, I think, 2 minutes, but 10 is a pretty good standard. So. And anything that you change in here of these bottom sections, the button that's abbreviated here very helpfully doesn't mean app as in that for your phone, it means apply. So if I want to change it, I hit that apply and on it goes again. There's also a default. So if something's changed and you're not sure why the date is looking strange or you can't be bothered fixing it or it's too hard or you can't work out what's going on here, just go back to the defaults and it should come back pretty much like it looks here. Alright, right click out again and go into the recording menu. 
So, the recording plan, I'll start with, up along the top there's two tabs, the recording plan is here. So at the moment, this thing, because it's on green, is recording 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Just solid, all the way through. Um, that's fine. You might want to do that. If you're a pub or a club that's open 24 hours a day, this is most likely what you're going to want to do. For a home, we might get, you know, the hard drives full in a few days because you bought a cheaper one or a smaller one. You might want to break this up a little bit and change some of the settings. So, if I go into here, well, there's, before I get to that, it's channel 1, 2, 3, and 4 for this one up the top. And once you've set it for one, you can copy it and basically paste it onto all the other channels if you wish. So, pre-record is essentially a buffer time that keeps up ahead. So, if you're doing something like a motion detection, it's always doing some kind of recording. It's just sort of ticking it over, ticking it over, ticking it over. When the motion detection happens, it gives you four seconds worth of pre-recording time. So let's say somebody walks past a window quite quickly. They might motion detect when they're sort of halfway across or three quarters of the way. But this will give you those extra four seconds ahead so you can sort of see them move the whole way through. And you can adjust that as well. I think up to about... 300 and 360 seconds, I think six minutes you can put in that one if you really want to. Um, in the settings for this, we've got three here. Regular motion detection and alarm. So regular is what we are talking about before. 24 hours a day, it just records through that period. Motion detection would be only if the motion detection happens within those 24 hours does it start recording. Alarm would be, well it's got some triggered alarm ports on the back of it. So let's say you've got an alarm system that you wanted to trigger this thing to record. You've got a PIR in a room where you don't have a camera. Somebody breaks in through the window there, sets the normal alarm system off, and the alarm system says to this, hey, turn on all your cameras, I want to see what's going on. It records from that point onwards as well. Um, at the moment I'm going to set up some motion detection, and I'm going to set it up. Well, Sunday, I don't really care. You know, this business is going to be closed, there's nobody here, so motion detection is fine. I don't really know, don't really care what happens to the rest of it. So the same thing for, uh, that's on Sunday. If I want to choose that for Saturday as well, I can. For our next period here, I'm going to set this one up for, uh, for, to go in here and set on Monday morning from, say, 6 a.m. through till uh, 6.30, 7, 7 o'clock p.m. And I choose regular, because there's going to be people here all day for it. I choose Monday and off it goes. It seems to me the Sunday is stuck, I'm not sure why, but that's probably because I just clicked into them. Sunday one, there we go. Beautiful, all right. My confusion, sorry about that. The Sunday, when I set in there, it automatically sets whatever you're doing to be applicable to Sunday. You can choose those extra times to also apply to other days, but you're probably going to want to do each individual day separately. Motion detection from, uh, say, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Motion detection apply. And now you can see that it's gone from those hours, those 12 hours of the day it's now recording, and the rest of the time it's doing nothing. And I'll probably want to go through in there and just do, um, probably swatch, switch that around and do this for the other hours of the day. Right, does that make sense for you guys? That's easy enough to go through. Right, I'll get out of that, and you can set the alarm times on through the same thing too. So that's the recording menu on the recording plan. But going back to the base stuff here, this is actually how good the quality is of the recording you're doing, how much you're broadcasting the rest. It will also affect how much hard drive space you go through. So again, you've got channels 1 through 4. You can copy and paste that through to all of them. The compression we're using is H.264. Um, very basically, it's a physical container for a video. that They can squeeze the size of it, means you can fit more data on your hard drive. There's only one option on these units, so we use H.264. The secondary one is the streaming gear that we're sending out over the internet for it. D1 is the highest resolution standard that these units can take. 
um, 700 720 lines worth of resolution. The other options for that are SIF, which is 382 lines of resolution. Uses a lot less, you can see the bitrate changes down the bottom when I go between the two of those. Uses a lot less data, but the image quality isn't as good. So if you're concerned about one particular camera, uh, my channel one is going to be the back alley where all the deliveries come through, where the thefts might happen and everything else. I'll put that in the best quality I possibly can. But maybe you can serve space. I'll change two, three, and four down to a lower quality. So it doesn't matter quite as much once they've got inside, but I need to see them in their license plate when they're outside. Frame rate per second is 25. That's standard. And there's two options here, constant bitrate and variable bitrate. Um, in general, constant bitrate is better. It'll consistently keep the same image quality no matter what you do. Variable bitrate tends to ramp up and down when things happen, like motion detection events or the rest of it. It's never quite fast enough, and so you miss some of the frames and things don't go through the way that they should. So leave that in constant and you should be good to go. The quality will come naturally out of that. Audio we're not recording on here at the moment, but you could. It has got an audio input. And you can manually set the bitrate if you prefer as well. I can set that to 1024 and off we go. Um, I did a bit of a calculation this morning on the 16 channel DVR. It's through our website we've got the calculation too. But 16 channels at full D1 recording, you barely get a day out of 2 terabyte hard drive. At that highest resolution on 16 channels, it's so much data that a massive 2 terabyte hard drive dies in about a day. So you're going to need to conserve either the recording time, so set those motion detections and the rest so that it only activates when you need it to, or choose some of these streams that are less important to drop that D1 recording time off from. If the quality is really super important for every channel all the time, everything, you're probably looking at the next level of DVRs, which is an IP-based one, that have network detached storage drives and multiple hard drives and computers that are backed up onto and all sorts of other things like that. It's not in this sort of realm, but for people that are really, 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 really conscious of that, the options are there for it. So, um, so we'll set that as it was, 1280. There's a snapshot setting you can put in here if you want to take a digital photo through any of these ones at the highest resolution. And there's a couple more in here which are basically what comes up on the screen when you're seeing it. So if you just want, don't want the camera, you don't want the date and everything else, click those, apply it, and then as you watch it back in a minute, all of this stuff won't appear on there anymore. We'll just do that. You can set where you want the camera the indication to be, so you can set it like a watermark in the middle, down the bottom, and it's just click and drag, which is kind of cool. The old ones never used to do that. Um, time display is the same sort of thing. On each channel you can put a time display wherever it's most convenient for you when it, play, when it plays back. Um, you can also do a, basically a uh, a playback in a monitor area as well to show what's going on and what sections have shown off for it. It's probably not all that essential. You're not going to use it very often, I would think. All right, so that's the recording setup. Any questions or any problems with any of that? Okay, so I might leave the network stuff for a little bit later because it's going to be the, the main juice of it. I'll just go through these very quickly. Alarm inputs, like we were talking about before. If you've got a Nest system that you want to trigger this thing to record, these are where you can actually set that to go. Uh, you can set it through a network alarm as well, detection alarms and all sorts of other stuff like that. Through motion detection, you know, say I don't care about the top part of this area because it's not likely somebody seven foot tall is going to walk through here. I only want the motion detection to go off in the bottom part. It means that if you're under an eave outside and you had moths and bats and things flying around, they'd hopefully be up in the top section not set the camera off, but everything through there would. Or if you're in a shop front, you, know, you could block it off for a window or a door or something like that. Um, video loss is another alarm setting for this one, so if I unplug the camera from here, it detects a video loss and this thing will allow you to essentially tell you what's going on with that from there. So. Um, the account setup is basically where you set your passwords and controls, um, add your users, change your users around, change the passwords, whatever else you want to do with it. Um, I know an installer who used to keep a scrapbook full of passwords, master passwords for all his alarm systems that he'd ever done. It's a great idea in theory because it means you can always go back and find out what's going on down the track. 
Um, it was up until the point where somebody decided to throw that out you know, with a whole heap of other stuff out of his filing cabinet and he lost all of them and had to root around the dump for about four hours until he actually found the book because it was too dangerous to leave out there. So I'm not sure that's the best idea in the world. Um, that too, yeah. And same, similarly with digital devices, you keep a digital copy on something like this one. If somebody really, really wants to, they can always break in and get a copy of it. They can sync it wirelessly, grab it off your computer, whatever else you want to do. So keeping records of it is a very tough thing to do. If you physically have a safe that you put these things into, that might work, but uh, everything else might be a bit tough. Um, adding a user is quite simple. You can tell them what they can do from here. So let's say we've logged into this as, instead of the admin like we are, we could set a user to have only possibilities to monitor stuff rather than play it back and check the recordings and the rest. So if the bosses might want the full control and the standard employees that rock up at 6.30 in the morning to turn up to the place to open it up might only have the monitor control for it all. And same with all the other accounts. The devices inside the network know where they are in respect to each other. And this IP address is generally set in conjunction with this and your router. Your router says you can have this IP address and this thing says I want that IP address. Once they've done that, internally everything's fine. And I could now, if this was plugged into the, ins into the network, into the network port here, I could log on through the internal network, type in that number and the port associated with it and see the vision from it and bring up the screens, play it back, do everything else like that you want to do through there. But that is only if I'm plugged into the same network that this thing is. If you are external, you need to have a different IP address. And that IP address is like your external phone number, the 932.18300 number, or the 1.800 number for us. Most of the rest of this gear is set internally, but set by the device that it does. This is by default the address for your modem or your router. If that's different, you'll want to change that. Most networks, if somebody has never done it before, it's probably going to default to that one. It's sort of your primary number one address. It's the zero number in the system. Um, at home, my network setup, I've got this on 192.168.1.12, for example. And I put that in here. And this one's fine because I haven't got anything else in that port there. Now, in front of you, you've got the handouts that talk about DHCP and those sort of things to do it. And just as a gateway, yeah. I, know, I notice all the TP links are 192.168.1.1 yep. by default, yep. but other brands seem to have different numbers. They do. They do. Um, most use the 192.168, um, but things like, uh, I think Billion uses 10, oh sorry, Telstra modems use 10.8. 14.0.78 or something like that for it. Normally if you flip the modem over, if it's a Telstra one, they've actually got a little panel on the bottom that says what their default IP address is. Otherwise, you can type that into a web browser or into a computer that's connected to the same network and it will actually bring up the login screen for your router. And that login screen or that address that you're given for the router through the paperwork, through some basic settings on the internet that are in there too, you can find out what that IP address or the native IP address for your router is. Um, people like me, my flatmate and other computer guys, we tend to change it around because there's, there are reasons why we prefer to have lower numbers for other things. If you come across a guy like us, let us do it because we prefer to play around with our own networks and do that sort of thing. Um, but in general, if you have a look at the modem, see what it says on the bottom of it, check the, ma uh, the manual and the notifications that are in there, it will always have a web set up for it. Type in that number and that's the same number that needs to go on the gateway. Uh, otherwise, it will be on the front page of the setup for the router as well. So, does that make sense? That's okay. Um, DNS servers won't matter too much in this case. Um, if you set up your own private DNS server and other things, you might want to put that in there. Um, DNS servers are, describe it, um, it's kind of like calling up the, uh, well, knowing that you're calling radio parts in your phone book, you click on radio parts and it calls us. You don't care what the number is, your number in the, your phone book is set up that radio parts equals this number. In a DNS way, 
when you type in www.google.com.au, it doesn't go to google.com.au, it goes to 21.0.72.161 or whatever it might be. And it's a, that number is set, Google's got hundreds and thousands of these things to set up for everybody. But the DNS server essentially says, so you want Google, all right, what's, what address is it at here that I can use it? Okay, there it is, grab it and take it back. Um, some people use their own internal ones to do things in their own system or if they want certain things only have certain access to the outside world. It's an unusual thing, so don't worry too much about that. That should be okay as is. Um, the physical address is actually the unique identifier for the network hub that's in here. So it's the DNA code for this particular DVRS network card. Um, when you're on a network and you want to work out what's going on with each of the devices that are there, if you know their MAC addresses, you know that you know it's between, well, I might be, this is essentially Ben, this is another one might be Tim, another one might be Mike, and we know that if I'm downloading via this one, then maybe there isn't enough downloads for everybody else, and you can locate that on the addresses too. Um, so yes, that's the basics of it, of that screen anyway. In your handout, you've got a thing called DHCP, which Bilgen talks about. And DHCP is essentially dynamic host control pro protocol, I think. And it means that if I set that one, it lets my router set my IP address. So let's say in this situation we were talking about phones. I have a whole bank of walk around wireless phones. Um, and as I walk in in the morning, I grab the first one off that bank or I grab the third one, whichever one's left there. And that number's mine for the day. And I put it back at the end of the night and off I go again. And DHCP keeps track of all of those and says that these six people have walked in, have these six numbers in this sequence and off they go. It's great if you're worried about all the devices that are on your network and you're worried about things conflicting with each other. It's not so good if you're trying to log into something because you enable DHCP and that IP could change. This IP address, the router might say, no, 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 I don't want you on 88, I want you on 32. Or I want you on 127. And you won't know that. The communication goes between there and your router without you having any impact or any control over it whatsoever. And so logging into it from a local network could be a right pain in the neck if you set that thing to go like that. Um, Bilgin has, what he does with it is essentially set ranges for DHCP and set statics for the devices that need it. So, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it, but it, it's essentially, it's good if you've got a lot of devices that plug in and out, plug in and out. Like here, we've got laptops that we take out on the road with us, come back, plug it in. We don't want these to have a static IP address every time because you run out of them. If you put them this way instead, you're on this DHCP, every time I plug in, I get a different IP address. I don't care. I can still connect to the internet. But it's really useful in that situation. With this, when you've got something that's physically fixed there that's going to stay there, you probably want that number to stay what it is all the time. So get into your router settings and set this thing to have that IP address. You can put a name, put the IP address, and bang, it'll stay there for all time. Um, now there are guides on how to do that online. There are quite a few of them, and I'll talk a few about those a little bit later as well. But for now, I don't follow exactly what Bilgin does when it comes to DHCP. Um, that's my personal preference. Some networks do it a different way, but when it's a physical thing like this one, if you can say it is always that number, and say the router always gives this thing that number, it's going to be set. And every time I want to log into it locally, it's always going to be in the same place. Um, like the taco truck that turns up at the side of the road, if you know it's always going to be in the same place, you can go out and get a good feed. If it decides to be a block away tomorrow, or three blocks in the other direction, or in Sydney the day after that, you're not going to know where it is and you won't know how to get a good feed. Does that sort of make sense, those analogies and my general rambling about all of that? Any questions or comments or um, problems with it? Anything I've said that's wrong? That could happen. Well, where's this taco shop? This is one on Bridge Road in Richmond. <laughs> Um, just, yeah, when, when you're going over those, obviously you're talking le the local network. Yeah, these are all the local network settings, yes. Uh, are you going to go over? I am. I'm going to yeah. go over the remote network stuff as well. Um, this is, what we've talked about here is everything to do with this building inside. 
Um, you can talk to anybody that's here, people wandering around with walk around phones and the rest of it. But if I want to connect to this to the outs from the outside world, I need to know where it is and I need to know its phone number, essentially. And that's where the external stuff comes in, which is where the iPhone setups, where the iPad setups, remote login and everything else happens. Okay? So if I go into advanced from here, I'm going to I'll run over a couple of these quickly. Alarm servers you're unlikely to come across. FTP servers unlikely in this context. Email is where you set if you want this thing to alert to tell you that something's happened. Chuck in your email, well, your SMTP server, which you'll get from your email provider, the port that it uses, username and password, if you want to put a special name in here, so say Ben's DVR says, title the DVR alert, and you put in the receiver address and everything else like that that you want, and off you go. And you can send those through quite easily. Um, I'd probably make that the last thing you do when they set these up. Um, because if you put it at the start, every time you disconnect a camera or change something over, it'll send you an email, and it'll send you an email, and it'll send you an email, and it'll keep sending you emails all day. Um, skip multi because that's the main one I want to talk about. IP filtering is talking about the people who can access the network remotely from certain IPs. So if you wanted to block Russia from dialing into this at any point, even if they have the right password, you could put the... IP addresses in for the range that have been given to all Russian businesses and block them out from ever seeing it, no matter what password and connection they have. Um, I think it's unlikely you're going to have that unless you've got a disgruntled ex-employee who knew, now works for a new company who thinks they might want to get in and steal something or find out secrets or work out who's working for it. Well, in Russia or <laughs> down the street or next door or anything else. But that's, if you're getting into those sort of settings, you generally got a bigger problem than a DVR is going to help you with. Um, NTP is a time server. So if you want to, you, this thing can, via the internet, log on to the atomic clocks in Boulder, Colorado. There's a Greenwich Mean Time clock and other stuff like that. It means that it always keeps your clocks pinpoint accurate. So no matter whatever else happens, it always says, bang, this is what time is. Um, it's neat. It's great. Works very well. Um, a nifty thing to have going if you wish to. Triple PoE, um, again, is an unlikely thing for you to come across. Triple PoE is essentially setting this thing up as if it's got, a, it's got its own mode, its own router built into it. So if you didn't have a router at home, you could connect, to, connect this thing to the internet anyway. You just need to get an account, plug into this thing as your primary source, put in the details that Telstra or Optus or whatever is giving you, Chuck in the IP address that they're going to give you there for it, and off you go. Um, essentially, this then acts like your main connection to the internet. So if you're out on a remote property where you don't want to have a modem fixed permanently, you could potentially go through here. Trouble is, you pay for these accounts. Um, Telstra and Optus and the rest of them, to set a fixed IP address for this and to do the rest of the settings, they're going to charge you for it. So just be aware of that for your customers too. So if you need one of those, talk to Telstra, Optus, whoever else you might want to use. Um, DDNS is an interesting little thing. Um, DDNS is essentially a dynamic DNS service. So the example we were using before about using radio parts, pressing that in your phone, and then it dials the number automatically because you've set that up previously. What if radio parts changed its number? every hour, every day, every week, every month. We just decided randomly to change our number tomorrow. You wouldn't know what it is. You hit that, num that name in your phone book and it would come through and go, no, that number does not exist anymore. Well, instead, how about you call call connection service, 12456 or whatever it is for your, you know, whichever provider you have, and say, I want to talk to radio parts. And we've told them that we've changed the number. We've told them that that's what's going on, that this is going to happen, and you call the call connection service, say radio parts, and they patch you through the right number. You don't care what that number is, but they keep a registry of that so that it always comes back to you. And that's what these dynamic DNS services do. They keep a register of what's happening with your computer, what's happening with anything that might go on, and bring it back to you. So in this case, let's say I choose DynDNS because that's one of my favorites. I go to 
dyndns.org, which is a website. I sign up for a free account and I say my uh, domain name is bendbr01. I get a username and password from them for this service and they'll give me a server IP and a port for it. And what this does is it allows you, if you've got an IP address that changes or a phone number that changes, using the analogy, this thing is always looking for and sending that data to these guys. And when you're looking for them, you're only looking for that name. You're only looking for radio parts. You don't care what the individual number is. So for people that have got IP addresses that shift and change, if you haven't got a fixed IP, this is the, one of the best solutions you can have. Otherwise, every time you're, you know, the way you connect to the outside world, if that number changes, whereas radio parts changes its number, nobody knows what's going on. And we lose all our phone calls, we lose all our business, and only the people can walk through the door actually buy anything off us. So, that's a little bit of a complicated one. Does that kind of make sense, or that, that works for you guys? Um, I use Dine DNS myself. Um, I know a lot of corporate customers and things like that that use it as well. They've got a fantastic free service. Um, so you don't need to pay anything, just sign up, get the details from them, plug all that in here, and this thing should keep updating and doing its thing. Um, the domain name here is obviously wrong. It would normally be bendvr1.dyndns.org or something like that. And every time it tries to connect to the outside world, it'll look for that. DynDNS will say, hey, Here's the number, and I can dial in and do whatever else I want from there. Right. So that's where that one comes from. So that's Dine DNS service that's there. Um, there are other ones, of course, as well. Um, some people prefer all sorts of different services, and some of them have got different features and elements. If you're really getting confused with it when you're out on a job site, these guys have got a $30 paid service as well. They basically walk you through the steps on everything you have to do to get these things connected. And I consider that a very valuable thing. Um, basically, a friend of mine is a network engineer. He charges $240 an hour to do consulting. No half hours, no 15 minutes. $240 before he even steps out the door to do it. $30 to get them to help you set it up and get everything working is a bargain. Um, and they're generally um, Indian call center, a Philippine call center, but they know what they're doing and they can just take you through the steps and get it working. Um, these services work really, really well. Some of our customers swear by them. So just keep that in mind. If you're getting stuck or you're, you can't get a static IP or other things are going wrong, 30 bucks and you'll probably get yourself out of most troubles that happen as well. Um, and if you build that into your quote in the first place, it can make your jobs a bit easier. Um, I've recommended to a few of the guys before make connections with the local IT guys, the local IT suppliers, wholesalers, retailers the tech support guys for the high school or whatever else it might be, maybe you can slip them 50 bucks to come out for half an hour to do this setup for you. And that will be an investment well spent. They'll go through and do all that while you're running cables, connecting stuff up, doing everything else that needs to be done. And you'll be out of there with these guys as their IT support from then on as well. So if there's a cable problem or a connection problem, they're going to come back to you. But if it's network related or whatever else, your other guy can get the call out and do whatever else needs to happen from there. Um, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Um, but we also want to look at the multicast. The multicast is where this thing says, here I am to the outside world. It sends the information to Louis iPad here, it sends it to my phone, it sends it to your iPads and phones that we've had set up before as well. So, to start off with, maximum connection, the number of uh, cameras and devices that can log into it at once. Um, depending on how secure you want to be, you might only want a couple of these. But keep in mind, it takes a few minutes at least for the thing to say, I've disconnected and I've got space available for somebody else. So if you're swapping backwards and forwards fast, it's a really bad idea to have just a few of them. There's normally not a problem with having a maximum connection of 50 or 100 more people. Just it's unlikely that there's that going to be that many people connecting into it at once. But it will drag the network down if there's that many. Um, network connection number and network downloads doesn't matter so much. The transfer mode and LAN downloads don't matter so much for this too. The LAN download is if you want to be able to back stuff up over your local network rather than via USB stick or something like that. And here is the important parts. Okay? This is how it communicates with the outside world. 
Um, port, you can think of, well, port is exactly what it says it is. It's a hole. It's a doorway. It's a gateway or whatever else you want to put there. Um, to walk into radio parts, you have to walk through a door which is there. We've got a couple of others around the building, but that's the only way you're going to be able to get in here. There are particular ports that do different jobs. Um, for data transfers and video transfers and web interfaces and other things like that. These are the ones that set up by default are in the system. These things need to be open to the outside world. It's like the door at the front here. Um, if I have a you know, if I have a key, I can walk through the door. If I let the door open, then anybody can walk through it. And that can be a security hole in your system as well. But it's the only way that if I want to dial in via one of these things to our DVRs, that I can do it. That port has to be open. All right. um, the way that you're going to do that, here you can set it with the router itself. The next setting you have to, uh, sorry, with the DVR itself, the next setting you have to do is in the router. And the router needs to know that this is happening. It's like a security guard at the door. It says these people walking through this door are allowed. So your router needs to know, that, needs to set up a thing called port forwarding, which is in there as well for it. There is a, every different router does it differently. Every modem does it differently. Um, the simplest guide I can give you for this is to jump online and have a look at a service like portforward.com. Have a look for the particular router that you're using and we'll bring it all up. So what I'm going to do here is plug this, plug my laptop in and show you exactly what that website looks like and how it all works. Jump away from the DVR. Okay. Oh, okay. Down the bottom here, they've got a list of routers. These are probably most of the common routers that are on the market today. Um, I'm going to zip down to the TP link ones that we sell. Because I obviously want you to buy more of the stuff that we sell, but let's say this one here. This is a wireless router from TP link. And look, they want you to pay 30 bucks and they'll do it for you. Skip the ad up the top. Go fast, and then you can choose a list of products. Okay. Now, actually, telling me what my external IP address is. Um, there isn't a specific guide for our DVR on this website. Okay. I'm just going to show you a generic one that will give you the same idea. And you just have to use the the numbers that are in ours instead. So there are links to say what is port forwarding. Show you the screenshots from it. There's a free program that's that's supposed to set it all up for you again, and there's guys to set up static IP addresses and so on and so on and so on. They've got a lot of paid services and some free services, most of which are pretty good. But for here, they're going to show you how to log into your router. So for this TP link one, the default IP address is this. If we were to choose a Netgear router or a Billion router or a Cisco router or anything else like that, up here will come the appropriate default address for it. So I plug this into the local network, I now want to control it. And I put in that number. Default name and password for this one is admin and admin. If you've changed it at home or if your customer's changed it, that obviously needs to go in there. And the next thing you're kind of going to come up with is a page that looks something like this one. Um, yes, okay. A lot of the stuff the guys at home will know how to do. If they've set up their own network, then they will have gotten used to this. In this case, we're going to applications and gaming. It'll be different for each router. We go in here, and then we've got a section which says port forwarding. Now, port forwarding is the way that um, it tells that if I'm logging in from my phone, this thing says, I want to look through port number 80 at this IP address to see what's going on. And it's trying to look like looking through the window at, um, I don't know, at Meyer at Christmas time. You want to look through that specific window, see that specific display, and you want to get permission to do it. Um, the analogy that my, uh, my network friend used was 
the windows at a stripper where you put the money into the slot and the window in front of you opens up and you can see whatever's going on inside. If you don't put the money in or you don't say this is the specific window, you're not going to see anything or anything that's going on for it. Um, whether you like that analogy or not is completely up to you. Um, but if you think about it in those terms, if I don't walk into that booth, I can't see what's going on. If the router, or in this case the sliding panel, doesn't know that there's somebody there by the uh, the money that goes into it or whatever happens, until I've done this a lot, um, you can't actually see what's going on inside. So in here you'll say, let's say my application down the bottom here is name one. In this case it could be DVR or anything else you want to put. I want 80. Doesn't matter about this, should be both. IP address which will be your, your external one, you want port 80 to go through, enable it and then bang, that's it sent that information through to say, yes, I've got permission to do what I say I'm about to do. Um, it, in this case, the, the router they've got uses this port number. Ours doesn't. It uses 8000 and 8001. So from that screen that I was looking at before, switch back over. That's the IP address you're going to want. And these are the three ports that you need to forward so that they can actually do their job. Switch back over here. And I'll need one for that first port, port 80. I'll need another one for port 8000, and I'll need another one for port 8001. Once all those are enabled and sent through to this thing, it's done. And it can connect to the outside world. And any requests that come from the outside world to your home for connections through those ports will get forwarded to the router. Oh, sorry, forwarded to the DVR. So. In this case, on your phones and iPads and whatever else you've got there for it, we've already done that with the main system over here. So you can log into that one from the outside by putting in the IP address of our network, the port that you need for it, and the password and the systems that we were showing you before. Um, and that is just being set up exactly the same way as it would be here. Does that all make sense? That part of it anyway? So, yeah. Yep. Phone keeps buzzing. Um, this IP address here is the next important thing that I wanted to bring up. This is your connection to the outside world. Think of it as the phone number. This is, when you dial that phone number, it says, here you are, lets you connect to the internet, does everything else like that for you, but it is the number that is really, really <coughs> a normal service like from Telstra or Optus or TP-Link or anything else like that will assign these dynamically. They'll change every few days. And, you know, every few days maybe, every month, every six months, every year, every two hours, could be any of those things for it. Because there are only a certain number of those IP addresses in the world and they ran out of the normal ones just a couple of months ago. So each time you want to connect up to Telstra, they don't want you to always be in the same spot because if every single one of their customers did it, they'd have to pay for about 10 times as many numbers, which don't exist anymore. So they give you a dynamic one each time because in the middle of the day when you go home, there's less people connected. When you're at night time, at, you know, sort of after dinner, everybody in Australia is pretty much connected to their networks and the system needs to spread out and send those IPs everywhere for them. Um, now, that is a problem if you're trying to dial into it from outside. Because if that isn't fixed, every time your IP address changes, and they don't tell you that it's going to change, it just does, you have to go back into your router, have a look and see what the new IP address is for the outside world, come back in here and change it again. Every time that changes. Generally it's every week or two yeah. weeks. Ooh. Yeah, it could, be, it could be anything. Depending on who you've got, they, they could be right bastards about it and change it on you very regularly, or in some cases they only change when servers go down, when the router restarts, or when something else happens to it. Um, so if I'm trying to log in by the iPad or the iPhones and the rest of it, I need to make sure that number stays the same all the time. And in our case, with our system, we've set up a static IP address for it, so that any time we want to connect to it, we just log straight in and off we go. Now. In this case, this is just random whatever number I've chucked in there for it. And the port number is just whatever I've chucked in there for it as well. In a real sense, if I switch back over to the computer now, go back up that list, you might have noticed as I went past, the previous things, the previous
previous page, yeah. Now there's a, a service called whatismyip.com, which does this. So, I'm connected through my mobile phone here, and I've been given an IP address by Telstra for this connection for that, but it also says, well, you've got a proxy because you're running from this to that to the outside world. But that IP address is the unique number that says, this is where I am and this is how I'm connected. If I was to turn this connection off and then reset it and do something else with it, it would probably come up with a different IP address. The mobile connections change very, very rapidly. Um, and that would be a problem if I was connected to this, to this, then I'd be screwed. Um, that IP address that's there is the one that actually goes in. Here, though, if you've got a static IP address, otherwise those Dyn DNS services that we were talking about before, they will give you an IP address for their servers or for their systems. You put that in there instead and put what's associated with it and that will allow you connected to the outside world no matter what changes on your internal network. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Um, Just Ben, the yeah. cost of a static IP address, what's the going rate right now? Five bucks a month? About five bucks a month is normal, yeah. Um, if you're a business, you can get a business <coughs> I think it's a business discount on a yearly plan or something to pay $45 a year or something like that, but it is a, it's a set cost. It's not hard to do. Just call your service provider and say, I need a static IP address for this. They probably will whinge and moan and, oh, we don't really want to do that. And, you know, if you consider all these other options and so on and so on, but, yeah, static IPs are a great thing if you've got one of these. Just put a static IP in here as your standard one. Put a static IP in there as that. Every time you log back in, it's going to be there. The same thing with the one that's here. You can use that iPhone and iPad app and the Android apps and everything else to connect to the one that's here. Anytime that we're at work, that thing is generally powered on, unless we're uh, replacing it with a new one, we're changing something in and out or doing something else there. But you can use those IP addresses to demo how our system works and how all that goes because we've got a static IP address. Right now, I'm switching back over to the iPad app, which some of you are working on. So, I'm going to switch to Louis' iPad here. So, this is the, this is the basic screen for the iPad app and for the iPhone app. It's exactly the same. Android one is slightly different, but it's very, very similar. Um, they've got a slightly different layout and the buttons look a little bit different. Otherwise, they're the same thing. At the moment, I haven't got anything showing because I'm not streaming anything. If I hit the button in the middle at the bottom here, it's basically the settings for it. This is our system. We've set up that IP address, set up that port number, password and username as it is there. And I can hit back, go back to here, press play, log in successful and suddenly I'm watching whoever that is that's over in our CCTV section. And that's live streaming. It's running a little bit jerkily, probably partly because I'm, yeah, we're running through a data connection rather than running directly, but I can switch between each of the channels that I want just by tapping the number for the channel that I'm interested in. There's nothing connected to number two, if I remember right. Number one there is. I can switch between the screens down the bottom by se selecting the different bands. And again, I'm not sure if that's actually got anything through it. Doesn't look like it. Twelve? No. It's going to be twelve. Let's thing. And... Wait. Um, I was trying the snapshot feature, which is down the bottom here. Don't touch it. Um, it crashed my phone four times yesterday when I was trying to play with it. So I think their software might still be a little bit buggy or something's going on there. Um, I had that working the other day, no problem. Excellent. Could be my phone then. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it um, And come on. Anyway. Okay, how's this working? Well, yeah, could be that too. Anyway, you guys have got it. There it is. 
probably trying to stream too much data at once with all of us logging in at the same time. But I think that guy's stealing something. Could be bad. <laughs> um, in iPhone and iPad, you can blow it up to the full screen by turning it and doing other stuff if you want to. It's, but I've doubled that for the iPad use. It's um, a little bit better on the phones because it's smaller. But does that? That's basically it. That IP address and the port number that are there are the ones that we've set for it. That static IP, that port allows our router to say, come in, have a look at this vision anytime you want to if you've got the right details. Don't have those right, or if that changes every so often, that's going to be a problem. So we'll lose this soon? Possibly. When that changes? Yeah. Um, this one is set statically, though. Um, if I was using a Dyn DNS service, for example, I could put Ben dbr onednsorg in here instead of that number, and it would go to the Dyn DNS servers and say, hey, where are, where are radio parts today? What's their phone number today? It will send the information back to the app, and then you can view it anytime you want to. So if somebody who doesn't want to pay for a static IP address, that Dyn DNS service works for them there as well. That's the detail. That's the address that we're going to be putting in there. Um, otherwise, the details that are in the instructions in front of you are pretty good step by step. Just be a little bit careful of that DHCP thing. If you let that change IP addresses internally all the time, then you could end up with problems if you're trying to log in locally. Anyway, so that's the basics of those settings. Um, and did you go over ActiveX when, when I was away? I didn't, no. That was one of the things. It's not working properly on here, so I'll do that in a second. But let me just get out of this. So that's the multicast settings for the network. Um, the manual for this DVR is actually quite good. They've got detailed instructions for most of the setups and things there as well. Um, and this is what's happening right now. That's just the state function. We're not using DHCP, we're not filtering, we're not caring about any of this other stuff, so there won't be anything on that screen. Um, so that's in the configuration. We've pretty much done all of that. Two last things I want to do. Storage. I've got a USB drive here. I'm just going to plug into the router. And I can go to HD Manage and have a look at what's on there. I can format the hard drive. Um, if I've got multiple hard drives, yeah. I can do other things with it from there. Um, recordings that are on there and recording times. And backup is where I've got my USB stick plugged in. I can back up from there. I choose the channel. Choose the time and I just hit. Where is it? Start. <coughs> Maybe the app, that's right. And this brings up all the files that are recorded individually on there at the moment. And I can get rid of that. I don't want those ones. And then I just hit start and it dumps them across to my USB stick. And then plug it into my laptop and view the view the stuff from there. It actually puts on there, which is kind of a cool thing, the software that you need to actually view it. So you'll get the question occasionally on what format it's in or how it all goes and everything else like that. It comes with the software to do that job for you. So. Um, and I'll shift across and just show you that in operation very briefly. I'm aware that I'm running a bit late on it. Um, software is this one, and you can see it is in a, I obviously don't have the right language installed for this to actually view, and I was running this a bit too early to actually uh, get in there and change the language over, but essentially it works like media player, it's got the same controls, the same locations as all that stuff, and on there at the moment I've got four files, I'll choose the first one. And you'll notice it's actually by, if you look at the file name, it tells you the time and dates and everything like that for it. Um, if I double click on that, uh, on through that, into this, it's now playing back on here. And I can full screen this and other things, I can skip backwards and forwards through a recording. Obviously, there's not much happening while it's just on test there. But that's essentially how easy it is to play back the files that are there for it as well. And the last thing I'll talk about is, as Mike suggested, ActiveX. Now, through there you've got the instructions on how to bypass it, but it's, ActiveX is a 
I can never get the right words to describe this, but when you go onto certain websites, they run software on your computer to allow them to run the website better or to interact with the website or to change something that's happening there. Um, it could be how it visually looks, how it controls, buttons to press and all the rest of it. The ActiveX is a great thing for sites that have uh, paid the setup for it, that have done all the, everything else that goes on. Now this won't log in because I'm actually not connected to anything here, but um, all I did was type into the title bar, if this was a local network, the IP address and followed by the port, the instructions are in there and they're correct. Plug that into it, type in the address and it should bring up this DVR on a local network if it's plugged in. That's as simple as it gets and it'll bring up an interface on the screen to show you how to use it, to click the buttons, to do all that other stuff as well. Obviously it's not connecting here because it's not connected to my network. However, by default, Internet Explorer says, I don't want to let that file come through. It says, I don't recognize it, I don't know its security level, this could be potentially unsafe because hackers use the same way to infiltrate your computer and take control of it and hack the Pentagon or whatever else it is they do these days. So you need to actually allow the web page to even load in the first place. Go up into your tools and into your internet options. As they described there, you can follow the steps straight as they go. Into security. Custom level. And it says OK. I skip through my list here. And there are a whole heap of stuff in here about ActiveX controls and plugins. There's quite a few of them here. And this is the bit that we're interested in, which is signed and unsigned ActiveX controls. Now, signed ones are safe ones. If you logged onto Microsoft's Windows update page, they'll ask you to run an ActiveX control that allows them to look at your computer and say what files are up to date, what's out of date, and how it all goes. That's normally fine. So you'll say, yeah, I want to enable it. I want to download everything that says it's secure. Um, it's probably better if you prompt it every time because somebody's paid for a license that they're trying to do it maliciously. It's yeah, not much difference. Um, the unsigned ones, though, are the ones like our DVR users, which is unsigned, which is, they don't know who it is, they don't know where it comes from, it's a no-name whatever, and potentially it could be very, very dangerous. And by default, Internet Explorer has that set. And on most versions, you don't even see that there's a DVR there. You don't even see that there's a web page there. It just comes up with connection problems or something else on that back screen. It doesn't even say that it's working properly because it thinks, no, no, this could be really, really dangerous. As soon as you say enable here, hit OK, it'll warn you that this isn't secure, this isn't safe, you sure you want to do this, and so on and so on. And then it'll keep warning you to say, this isn't safe, this isn't secure, and so on. I usually use prompt because it allows you to, when the page comes up, Again. There. You'll notice they've helpfully put it in orange to say this is the bit that's really dangerous, you should fix this. Go into the prompt one that's there, and it means that when you go to that website again, so I've typed in the address followed by colon 80, which is the port. If this was actually live and active, it would then pick up all the cameras and the rest of it. Without doing that, you'll never see it, it will never work. Okay. Um, Internet Explorer likes ActiveX. All the other browsers don't really support it. So if you log in via Chrome or Safari or anything else like that, you're going to be out of luck. Um, I had a customer a little while ago that was using a Mac to try and log into this thing locally and remotely. Whatever work. Um, unless, until they put Internet Explorer onto Macs that works with ActiveX and the rest of it, it won't happen. She had to run a, an emulation software to actually run Windows on there just so she could log into the internet so she could view her DVRs. So I paid $200 for a bit of software and then $300 for a Microsoft Windows license to be able to watch what's going on. So if you go into somebody that's very, very Mac happy, just beware that might not work so well for you. All right?
But that is the basics of ActiveX. And I think I've covered everything that's in that little handout and everything that I can possibly think about for the system itself. Um, and I was just going to say, that, yeah, DVR is also under any any company like us. Um, we have cameras everywhere, of course. But um, the most common reason why we use our cameras on a day-to-day -day basis is actually all our picking benches. So when you guys say, "I didn't get," you know, "I didn't get this package," we have cameras above each of the picking stations. And so we can go back, we check that we actually put it in the box, and it's either you guys or the freight company. We can deduce that. So if anyone does dispatching of goods, that's one that you always make sure it's above the picking bench, pointing down, and of course cashiers. Above every cashier station, you should have a camera pointing down at the cashier's till. Absolutely. And then one of our cashiers thinks it's um, a little bit um, <laughs> intrusive, but at the end of the day, it's to clear those to clear all your cashiers should money go missing. Exactly. Um, the other one is the streaming. We had, in the previous version, if you logged in and out of your, your app regularly, it would freeze up over a period of time, because not because of the DVR, but the amount of data. Um, this one has three levels of data streaming. It's got D1, which is the best. And normally, just the best DVRs have D1, which is at 1,280 bits. Then you've got SIP, which is half that. And then this one also runs a mobile, which is also unusual, a mobile version, which is just 160, I think. Yeah. Which is, it actually means that your phone won't crash nearly, well, it, you know, it can always crash if, if there's no, too much data coming through, but it'll be much, much better yeah, than the um, previous versions. Well, was, while I was doing the research for it, I actually got the data figures for those ones. And you, you look at an iPhone screen and the amount of pixels and things like that for it. Um, D1, 720 by 576. So it's roughly uh, 415,000 pixels worth of information that's being sent. SIF, which is 352 by 288, is 101,000 pixels. QSIF, which is that data streaming, one, uh, the mobile stream, is 176 by 144 for about 25,000 pixels. So 25,000 pixels versus you know the more than 100,000 that the old ones were doing makes a bit of difference. And an iPhone, iPhone's resolution is 480 by 320, which is about 153,000 pixels. So there's more than enough capability between those two to actually do it. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting. The equations are quite uh, complicated once you get into it, but the fact that you can stream this securely to it, that it doesn't crash, that it's going to be reliable and all the rest, apart from whatever's happening with the snapshot feature on mine, it works really, really well. Um,